Hi, everybody. Uh, can everybody hear me? Good. Uh, many thanks uh, for joining, um, particularly on uh, such a hot day. Um, before we start, I'd like to set out some Zoom housekeeping rules. So just reminding you, I mean, you've been through this, I assume, but to keep your microphones muted and also could I ask everybody who's not on the panel, so basically the audience, to shut off their cameras. I mean, that, uh, that is probably quite comfortable anyway, so we cannot see what you're doing, you know, and you can uh, relax and enjoy, but it also has the advantage that actually you will have a clearer idea um, who's on the panel. Um, so we thought that would actually would be quite helpful. And then thirdly, um, we would like to record this session. Um, I actually see on the top left, is it already recording, Catherine? It might, might be. Uh, so, the, uh, so the warning here, so you are being recorded. Um, I don't know for those that might be joining later, I would assume that there might be a little button to press that you are happy to be recorded. But uh, so this just as a warning, so for um, our students or anybody, to actually have a look at this discussion at a later stage. Um, so this, this panel discussion is part of our Lance Sustainability Week. And uh, actually, massive thank you to uh, Catherine and uh, Adam, our media ambassadors, uh, who have put together um, a range of activities uh, for this week. And uh, in this panel discussion, we want to tackle the question, how can we increase student engagement with environmental activism and sustainable entrepreneurship. And uh, we are delighted uh, that we have a wonderful panel of um, academics, entrepreneurs, activists um, who engage with these, uh, with these uh, uh, questions. And the session will pretty much fall into three sections. So we have the first round where the panelists will introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what they are doing. Um, then a second part uh, where, um, well, Catherine and Adam have prepared questions um, to get the discussion going and to initiate the conversation among the panelists. And then finally, Adam uh, will have an eye on the group chat. Um, so please feel free to post questions at any time of the discussion. Um, very much welcome. So I encourage you uh, to use that. And time is tight because this session will close at 5.15. So this is why I keep this absolutely short, but just a reminder um, to the panelists to stick to the five minutes. Um, and then we kick off with Joe, and the question, please, can you tell us a bit about yourself and how you are contributing to sustainability? Thank you, Julian. Um, so uh, my name's Joe. Uh, I'm a master's student at the University of Birmingham, and I'm just finishing off uh, my thesis. Um, I, I have started a company at uni. Uh, it's actually uh, started with the Vice Chancellor's Challenge. Um, it was something I, I first, um, it was the first idea I, I put through with them, but um, it's also been in conjunction with the startup games at the University of Birmingham as well, and it, it won the innovation prize. Um, it's still an early development, um, so it's gone beyond the concept now, um, so it's in, develop, it's in the developing stage. I'll just have a talk about the concept and uh, firstly what it is. So um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of waste going to landfill and it's accumulating, so it's, a, it's a linear system. Um, where it's just the accumulation of waste which has been happening since the 60s and so landfills are overfilling and all our resources are, um, are heading straight there with no value. Uh, so there are recycling plants at the moment that um, usually take sort of partially pre-sorted um, materials and they can extract some resources that way. The problem with that is that you have to transport all these, all these materials to these sites that require a lot of maintenance, a lot of um, and huge plantations, a lot of people and the fees cost are quite considerable. Um, so the biggest problem is, is how to reduce the amount of um, the amount of costs it involves in reclaiming back 
these resources that are in themselves quite valuable, but they take a, take a lot of money to actually extract it back. So um, my my, my um, uh, uh, um, concept is to basically uh, create an artificial colony of ants, which can which have a camera and some and a gra and something to grapple with and its own container. And what they will do in any circumstance with just general waste that doesn't have to be um, doesn't have to be pre pre separated in any way. It can it can detect certain materials and extract them exclusively. So, for example, I may have one robot looking exclusively for aluminium tin cans that will have a sensor on it, and it will be able to pick it up. Another one will be able to pick up certain types of valuable plastics. And so, it's a, the reason why this would be economically viable is because there's very little human intervention. So you don't have to pay all these fees. You don't need big startup costs for big plantations. They can just go on a site where there's rubbish and they can just start mining. So you only need one person really to, to operate the whole thing just by basically hitting go. Um, so they will, so they should be able to recover these, recover these materials. Um, and when they're, for example, there's an initial colony of 10 robots, when they start accumulating these valuable materials, they get sent off and they're sold for scrap. And so this scrap is allowed, then allows there to be more investment back into the company and to create more robots. So it's, it's exponentially grows. And so it's, it's sort of like a bacteria Petri dish where it self funds itself. And then so it just eventually grows and grows. And uh, even though individually they might be quite slow, but the unit itself is quite powerful. Because if you can think of like uh, one conveyor belt, maybe someone someone separating things on a conveyor belt, that might be quite fast in itself. But with the accumulation of lots of slower robots, will actually the net overall will be quite fast and increasingly so. So that's the that's the whole concept. Does that make sense? Have I explained myself kind of well? Well, that's good. Great. Um, I think I think um, yeah. So if there's any more questions, I think that's about the concept. So if, <laughs> Is there anything else I should, <laughs> I could continue? No, no. Uh, brilliant, thanks, uh, Joe, because also uh, excellent keep, keeping to the time. I mean, this is perfect. Um, so on to, to Marianne from uh, the Fashion Society. Thanks, Julian. Um, this year, I'm the president of UOB's Fashion Society. Um, the society's main focus is basically slow fashion. And for people who don't know what slow fashion is, slow fashion can be defined as basically the opposite to fast fashion. It's an awareness and approach to fashion that considers the process and resources required to make the clothing. Um, there's a big focus on sustainability, so sourcing materials, um, using sort of ethical practices um, in and around work and employing um, garment makers. Um, one of the main ways that slow fashion encourages um, sustainability is through slower production schedules. So um, instead of um, a new collection being released every week, it's a couple of times a year. Um, lower wages, um, sorry, fairer wages um, are something that's really pushed for, especially in um, lower income countries where there's um, often a lot of exploitation. Um, and lower carbon footprints is um, another thing that is pushed for, something that's often um, a sort of overlooked in pushing for sort of fairer fashion ethics is um, the transportation costs and exporting materials and importing clothes to um, often the West. Um, so they advocate for lower carbon footprints um, and ideally overall zero waste. Um, as a society, um, we do our best to promote um, a variety of resources um, on ethical slow fashion, whether that's sort of um, articles or documentaries um, and tips about sustainable fashion, things that maybe people haven't thought of. Um, I think that upcycling is often seen as something that requires a lot of time and effort. So we try and sort of provide ways that people can participate in upcycling that actually debunk the idea that you need sort of about five different things before you can start making something cool and unique. Um, and we also try and hold events that focus on slow fashion rather than fast fashion. Obviously with the pandemic, this is something that maybe is hindered come the start of the term, but we're hoping that especially next year, we can start holding things 
that um, can introduce people to slow fashion and help them make choices that are um, much better and do not involve fast fashion. Um, I haven't got anything else to add, so um, yeah, I mean, if there's any questions, I'm willing to answer them at the end. No, excellent. Uh, brilliant. So on to Nana. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. My name is Nana Bonsu. Um, I'm a research fellow in sustainability with the Center for Responsible Business at the Birmingham Business School. Um, my research is much more into transitioning to responsible and sustainable futures. And then I've got a current project, looking at the project portfolios, uh, one focuses on the value chain dynamics in transitioning to low carbon and circular economy, with a particular focus on the electric vehicles and then some of these low carbon technologies. And I've got one which is looking at the nexus interactions of mining raw materials the cleaner energy transition and then sustainable transport. And then um, I've got a project to looking at um, environmental emissions and poor air quality in low medium income countries. So um, this is the um, project that I'm currently working on. Um, my previous experience was much more working with the local authorities um, within the area of sustainable travel and transport. But prior to that for my PhD, um, I work on um, sustainable forestry and land use ecosystem services, looking at the policy and governance frameworks to address conflicts. But prior to that, I want to I will work on some of these sustainability um, projects within businesses, looking at the environmental health and safety and quality management systems, and then um, work within the mining companies as well, like within the area of asset production engineer, looking at this kind of environmental water quality and manufacturing of explosives. So. Um, that is me, and then I'm ready for um, some of the questions that we could be exploring uh, going forward. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks and uh, Ellie. Yes, hello. Um, I'm Ellie. I'm studying political science and international relations at Birmingham. Um, I'm going to be talking about an app which I'm looking to develop called Snap Recycle. Its overall goal is essentially to improve residential household recycling and um, rates sim by simplifying and incentivizing recycling. Um, so recycling might seem like a small issue, but it's actually inextricably linked to a host of issues at the heart of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So this includes sustainable cities and communities and responsible consumption and production. To offer some more specific figures um, to demonstrate recycling's influence on the climate crisis and on sustainability, um, extraction and primary processing of raw materials accounts for 20% of the health impacts of air pollution and 26% of overall global emissions. Uh, recycling, aluminium can, recycling aluminium cans can save 95% of the energy required to make new cans. Recycling paper saves 60% of the energy and recycling plastic and glass saves one third of the energy required to make the products from virgin materials. And um, finally, recycling in the UK is estimated to already save upwards of 18 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. Um, so it's evident that improper waste disposal is incredibly problematic. Um, and recycling has thus far been demonstrated as a key solution and forms an integral part of the circular economy. Um, so Snap Recycle, which is the initiative I'm working with, it began um, in June 2019 through the Birmingham Project, which is a two week project where students come together to um, Kind of try and solve a real world problem using a digital resource. Um, after the project, myself and two other members of the team, um, we decided to continue pursuing the initiative to see if we could have a real impact with what was at that stage just an idea. Um, we don't have an app yet, but we've come leaps and bounds in the last year, um, including representing the University of Birmingham in the U21 RISE Awards um, and entering in a number of an actors' competitions. Um, we're positive about our continuing progress into the next year. Um, so the app has a range of different features, all contributing to the overarching goal of simplifying and incentivizing recycling um, in residential areas. Arguably, the information element is the most important. So this provides users with sp council specific information on what you can recycle and specifically how you can recycle it as an aim to tackle contamination in recycling facilities. Um, and it also gives you information on bin collection days, for example. Um, 
So it also has the ability to track users' recycling information, giving users the ability to kind of put their recycling in a broader context. So for example, seeing how much they recycle over a long period of time, as well as seeing how much they recycle in the context of their local community. Um, because that can see how they're having a greater impact. Snap Recycle also has non-monetary rewards in the app, um, so they come in the form of online badges. Users will be rewarded for recycling regularly, logging into the app um, and remaining active for a number of days, that sort of thing. Um, another key feature of the app we're trying to implement is um, the community arena. So this is offering users the ability to share repurposing suggestions with other users. So while recycling is an amazing way to engage in the circular economy, we're well aware that it's not a flawless solution. Um, and repurposing and reusing things often contribute far less greenhouse gases than actually recycling something does. Um, however, it's quite difficult to actually know what to do with your old product. So what packaging, what you can do with that um, after you finish with it. So that's why we've created this page so that people can share particular solutions which they've used to repurpose old things in the past, for example. Um, so a few of our short and long-term objectives, um, which we hope to achieve through the elements I've mentioned in the kind of app elements above. Um, so firstly, to improve the quality and quantity of household recycling um, in the long term, so meaning a reduction of contaminated recycling um, and a reduction in recycling going to landfill unnecessarily. Um, secondly, making users want to recycle. So this is more short term through the, um, through the badges, the non-monetary rewards and incentives that way. Um, and finally, bringing communities together in pursuit of the common goal um, and getting people behind the idea of the circular economy. We're enthusiastic that Snap Recycle, after its release, will be an effective tool for improving recycling rates um, and improving enthusiasm in the circular economy as a whole. If anyone's interested in knowing more about our journey, past, present, future, or want to know more about the app, then I'm happy to receive any questions, messages, emails, anything like that. We're always looking to gain an insight into the unique struggles people have with recycling. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Ali. Um, as far as I can see, Katie hasn't joined, right? So um, no, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we move on to uh, Julie as our final speaker. Thank you. And those are such interesting projects already. Um, I don't have a project. I'll just tell you what I've been doing. I'm a reader in Asian studies in the Department of Political Science um, here at Birmingham. And uh, lately, I was also the sustainability lead for the College of Social Sciences. Um, I think uh, what my credentials, if I have any, is that I teach on climate change, research on climate change, and I'm, I try to live in the pursuit of addressing climate change. And um, for example, um, this is important in a minute, um, I've given up flying. And as an academic, that is raising all sorts of uh, difficult consequences for me, uh, which are interesting. <laughs> and we can take that up. I think there were two things I'd like to make, two quick points. And one is from the teaching and one is from this administrative role. From the teaching, it's about knowledge. I think one of the problems for students I deal with is that climate change is too big, it's too intimidating, it's too complex. But instead of um, making, that, making us move away from it, I think it needs, we need to be more engaged with the knowledge base. I agree with Greta Thunberg that we need to follow the science, we need to try and understand the science, um, we need to sort of domesticate that science. But at the same time, I think we also need to interrogate the values that lie behind the science, that lie behind the activism, um, there are many claims that climate action and activism is very white, is very unequal, um, and that these issues I think we really need to be thinking about. If we think about the, the notion of the Anthropocene, which is, as you know, the geological age um, where we have a predominance of human action over the climate, and now this has been um, critiqued with the notion of ecocentrism that looks at the intrinsic value of non-human nature, nevertheless, there's a very Western centric approach to, to the idea of ecocentrism that I think we need to engage with and decolonizing that part of the curriculum is just as important as working in other areas um, of doing so. So I'm trying to look at non-Western ideas of man and nature, look at non-Western ideas of environmentalism, and I think we need to feed all those ideas into our work. I would recommend uh, a great book um, called uh, The Unquiet Woods by Ramachandra Guha of 1989. It's about a local peasant communities that work towards forestry, claiming forest, reclaiming forestry. 
and it has some really important messaging for the bigger uh, picture that we're trying to tackle. Um, secondly, in practice then, as the sustainability lead and with Julian's help and the help of others, we, we put together a proposal for a travel better decision tree. When we think about our annual footprint, average footprint in the UK is about five tonnes of carbon. In 2010, it needs to be about 1.5 tonnes of carbon per person by 2050 in order to get anywhere near meeting our climate goals. If you think about a London to New York return trip will cost you about 0.67 tonnes of carbon. On top of that, you wash your clothes, you go to work, you take public transport, you take non-public transport, you have green or non-green energy, you have one, two, three, four more children. Each of those things has a, how many emails you send, each of those things has a consequence for how much carbon you spend as an individual. And I think some of our practice is based on the fact that we don't understand the consequences of our individual actions. So with our travel better uh, decision tree, we looked at, do we need to travel? And COVID has given us an opportunity to reflect on this. I know we're not all great lovers of Zoom, but we can work via Zoom at times. And if I do need to travel, how do I travel? So again, um, my challenge was to give up flying and see what consequences. And that has consequences for my promotion prospects, for my working ability, for my networking. It's not a straightforward decision, actually, in terms of my, my career. Um, but my challenge to you is, is there anything in a sustainability pledge? Is there one small thing you could change to making that carbon footprint print just a little bit less? And I'll leave you with that. Anybody who wants to contact me anytime, uh, like Ellie said, I'm always around. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Julie. Um, and thanks everybody to all uh, five, five panelists. Um, I mean, that already each presentation in itself I mean, raise a number of questions, um, and I would encourage you to to, to use the the group chat actually, um, where I'm, I'm sure the uh, panelists also can have an eye a little bit on the group chat. And if there's a very particular, specific question addressed to one of the individual uh, contributions on slow fashion, on art eater, on the snap recycling app, um, then then do so. But um, to to start and kick off the conversation, I would now. Uh, pass on to Catherine to, 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 to ask our first, first question to the panel. Thank you. Um, yeah, they're all re really interesting. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah, the first question we were just wondering, is it, oh, I think everyone here has an interest in sustainability, but um, for those who don't, what do you think are the main constraints that could put students off the term sustainability? There's anyone who would like to go first? I could go. Um, so, so just just to so I got the question right. Um, is it what's putting our students from going into the industry after they graduate, or just in general? Um, is it, am I is that correct in both? Are you sort of saying? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, in both. I think I think one of them is. I think for me, from what I've noticed, there are two things um, which have kind of been mentioned before. What some people think it's futile, that their, their individual um, impact is making very little, which means that multiple people, but it, this accumulation problem happens where everybody thinks that and then it does have an effect. Um, I think secondly, in terms of an industry, people think there's no money in it. In fact, there's a massive decline of of people going into that area and there's things like the Arley project which is actually you know that the University of Birmingham are doing trying to attract more people into the area um, but it's actually not true there is um, there is an acute a huge amount of money going into these sort of sustainabilities I think uh, there's a there's a new um, a new investment was given of two million to something called Grey Parrot recently which is something very similar to what I'm doing AI um, sorting um, rubbish and so forth but uh i think i think if that marketing that marketing of, of people going into it could be changed that's one positive thing that could happen yeah i hope that answers your question well, I think thank you thank you joe has anyone else got any thoughts on what could pop people off sustainability um yes yeah, sort of building on what julie said i guess um it's it's quite difficult to understand for people to kind of get their heads around it it's a very complex issue which essentially makes you feel really guilty about a lot of things. Um, and I think subconsciously, lots of people, they sort of don't want to get too in depth with it or they don't want to learn about it in case that 
stops them from being able to do things which they were previously able to do sort of guilt free like without a care in the world sort of thing but yeah I think that's kind of a big contributor to why people aren't engaged in the day-to-day -day actions yeah definitely I think as well as what you're saying it is quite vague as well I guess um anyone else what have any thoughts right okay um what I think uh about sustainability is that um, it has become a buzzword in the last decades, you know, and that um, I think it depends like how it's going to be defined based on the, um, the specifics and the priorities that's going to be depending on the particular context of application. Um, but I think in essence, it's much more or less trying to look at uh, meeting the needs of today without compromising the needs of the future or tomorrow. But I think uh, there's a key message. It, it depends on um, how a person sees sustainability. Is it more or less as an output or as an input when it comes to sustainable futures? And I think uh, looking at it from like the common definition of sustainability, you could see that it's much more or less, um, it sinks or it's much more or less relate to the meaning of sustainable development. And then I think the good news is that we've got these 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, that in which uh, if one person wants to pursue, like in the course of trying to understand sustainability, at least it gives that kind of person the backdrop to understand when it comes to the context. So like uh, if you look at um, people working on this kind of recycling and all, so you could be having that, like uh, you have SDG 12, trying to address all those kind of issues and trying to get to that kind of sustainability bit uh, looking at the um, the year 2030 and even beyond. So I think it depends on like the industry and um, when it comes to the level of thinking, what one person wants to do. Like for instance, uh, I'm working on this kind of air pollution. So it's much more based on the SDG3 when it comes to good health and well-being. So um, if I want to integrate it more into, let's say, other emissions, then I could be bringing in the SDG 13. So like when it comes to the policy dynamics and looking at the governance frame, then you're trying to make sure that this could be the main output when it comes to sustainability. So um, I think in general terms, I would say that um, it's very vague, but then uh, when it comes to the pathways to achieving it, you've got the SDGs that you can be doing it. And the um, SDG 17 much more or less provides all the roadmaps when it comes to, it doesn't provide a roadmap per se, but it got some sort of attributes when it comes to how it's gonna, you're gonna be partnering with um, other industries or academics or experts in trying to achieve to that kind of goals. So that's my contribution on that. Great, thank you. Um, so just moving on to the next question, um, what this might be a conflict because I know lots of you are in uh, different areas of sustainability, but what unsustainable practices do you think to be the most problematic and what do you think, what steps could we take to reduce this? I think greenwashing is a big problem. Um, people who don't know greenwashing is the idea that um, companies will capitalize on the demand for environmentally sound products um, and you can sort of spot this quite easily usually um, they'll just sort of throw loads of buzzwords at it like ethical sustainable um, but that sort of sustainability element um, will rarely be reflected um, throughout the company there'll be no sort of mention of practices behind the garments so suppliers factories workers or sort of anything about the company behind the scenes and its efforts sort of have inclusivity and sustainability um, reflected at every level in the company. Um, I think um, it's problematic because it's purposely misleading to the public. Um, I think it can also lead to people just sort of, again back to the point of futility, um, people just sort of think what's the point if there's companies going around claiming they've used sort of recycled materials and pushing people to buy it only to find that um, it's been unethically made or well, why should I try and buy these good 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 products um, if the companies themselves can't try it's a real big problem in fashion um, not to sound like I'm picking on anyone H&M are incredibly bad for it um, there's been sort of plenty of investigations into um, them, one of which found that they'd been incinerating unused and new clothes. Um, they also used something called the closed loop model, which is um, the idea that 
they have recycling bins in the store members of the public can come and donate unwanted clothes and then in return for that they get um, a discount to buy new clothes these new clothes are obviously um, made via fast fashion um, so that sort of defeats the point of I mean it defeats the point of H&M having a sustainable range but also it defeats the point of sort of pushing recycling and donating clothes in a sustainable way because then you're still purchasing the clothes that are causing the problem um, it's obviously a really big problem to try and tackle I think it just um, reinforces the idea that a complete overhaul of the systems that we sort of connect with and um, interact with need completely changing I think the um, short term and sort of um, on sort of I guess an easier level it's just making people aware of things and making sure that people have all the information to make in informed choices about the clothes that they buy. Definitely thanks Marianne. Um, Julie did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Uh, yes uh, just to endorse everything that Marianne has just said and to say actually more fundamentally um, some of the problems with ecocentric um, approaches is that they justify the continuation of the neoliberal model as we have it all at the present time and actually it's the, many of the problems inherent within that model the queues outside Primark the 26 pound flight to Italy um, you know it's not it's where, where do you deal with those questions and that has to be a, a, a root and branch reform of the model and nobody turkeys don't vote for Christmas so how do you get short-termist politicians on board you, the, the answer there is it's very very difficult you can't um, but you, the youth voice has got to speak up and I think people have to start speaking with greater knowledge of the actions that they're taking that the actions that they have will be on not only on their children's lives but on their own lives now um, we haven't really got time to be constantly stroking this neoliberal model to make sure it's okay as we're trying to make adjustments along the way. So I, I, I completely agree with Marion. Yeah, definitely. And I think as well with um, the cheap flights you were saying about as well, that brings me on to say what extent do our panellists think that the media coverage accurately informs these issues and what do you think the media could do more of? Right, okay. I'm going to add to what uh, Julie just said. What I could see when it comes to the areas of being like more most problematic, um, I call it uh, dealing with the politics of sustainability and the disadvantage. And I think um, for the past couple of, I'll say months and years, you could see um, governments like when it comes to free society and um, being climate deniers and deregulating the oil and oil industry, including the fossil fuels as well. And you could see, you could be seeing that um, historically policies that have could, policies have been much more centralized within this kind of um, when it comes to industries, like as well as landfills, all those um, much more located within disadvantaged communities. And I think um, this particular pandemic, being the COVID, is a, a typical manifestation when it comes to um, what I'm calling this kind of politics of disadvantage within um, when it comes to um, some of these communities. So um, I think um, until some of these issues are being much more looked into, um, it's going to be very problematic and we cannot achieve anything anyway. And then when it comes to the area of sustainability, somebody can make a case when it comes to the economic aspects. But then um, I think we've seen how fragile um, our healthcare system is. Um, as opposed to more or less dealing with some of these issues um, when and this pandemic um, came. So um, I don't know, but pathways leading to this kind of sustainability or even achieving this kind of um, SDGs by 2030, I think um, it's going to be challenging until some of these politics when it comes to sustainability are much more addressed. Yeah, great. Thank you. Has anyone else got any thoughts on the panel? Either leading on from Nana or with the um, media coverage? Um, I'd like to say in terms of, so mainstream media, I think that the amount that they actually cover the issue of climate change is incredibly infrequent considering the gravity of the issue. And I do think that that makes it difficult for a lot of people to understand the gravity of the issue of the issue when kind of it's only getting brought up once every month once every couple of weeks sort of thing 
Um, and when, when it is brought up, it's not typically front, front page news. So unless you follow the specific topics and climate change, you don't actually see the news. Um, and often the news stories, they don't generally, um, they don't generally provide users with like feasible action points for how they can make a difference. They kind of have this habit of kind of pushing the pressure onto the government and saying, well, the government needs to do this. The, the government's done this, but this isn't going to achieve this. Um, and these industries are doing all these wrong things. It kind of makes people sit back and think, well, I'm, I'm powerless to the, to the change sort of thing. It's, it's all the, the, the government and the, the companies which can have an impact when actually there is loads of small things uh, like Julie was saying that, that people small actions that people can take to make a difference um, yeah so I think the fact that it's quite difficult to find out this information without going out of your way it does make it much more difficult the media could definitely have a much more influential role in this yeah definitely and with um, regards to these small actions what do any of you think that we could be doing as students or young people and are there anything that's around campus or university that people could get involved in? Yeah Julie? I think on this students have got more purchase than they than they realise because it's not the government they have to influence it's the vice-chancellor and the senior management team of the universities. And I think um, I would like existing students to encourage uh, would-be applicants to ask better questions of our university. What, what does sustainability mean for the university that you apply to? What are the uh, recycling? You know, I have students who, who want to know more about this and they don't know. And I think you can, I think if I look at my children who are teenagers, they talk about climate change and environmentalism a lot as part of their school um, and sadly for them also at home a lot. Um, but um, when they get to the age where they would be choosing for a university if they went, um, this would be one of their demands, not a, not a request or a luxury. They would not go to a university that doesn't hold these things dear. And I, I would like to see more uh, influence of those students coming through to say, how could you go to a university that has um, not environmentally unsound investment portfolios or that doesn't have a travel policy or that doesn't. And those kinds of questions, I think, can be can be articulated by that body of incoming students. And they're the ones who can speak with their feet when they if they choose universities that reject those options. Thank you. Uh, maybe even to, to, to add, uh, misusing my role here a little bit, but uh, to, to, to what Julie and Ellie said before, um, I mean, yes, it, it is a complex issue. And I think it's not just a matter of infrequent coverage. And I completely agree with that uh, in the media. But I think it's also how it is narrated, um, which basically links back also to something that has been said previously that maybe students or all of us are put off by sustainability because it induces this sense of guilt i like that and this is further enforced in how media covers i mean yes the situation is grave but i think nevertheless we want to have fun in life i mean this is sort of a, a, a big driver and it, it almost seems if, as if, or I think we're under the wrong assumption that if people promote and push forward sustainability, they're sort of spoiling that fun. Um, and that has, I guess, I mean, that also ties in with, you know, what has been said about the neoliberal framework. I think we really have to rethink and re-narrate value and what we value. Um, I mean, on the positive side, I think change is underway. And I found your question absolutely fantastic, like what puts people off, but I'm almost under the impression that my generation and older generation is actually the latecomer. I mean, yes, we need to do more to get students engaged and for student activism and entrepreneurship. But I think a couple of years ago, such a panel probably wouldn't have taken place with actually, you know, and we, there was a lot of student teams, projects, stuff going on to choose from. And the pushback, for instance, you know, what, what Julie was talking about with travel policy and, you know, for us, uh, like, like, like uh, academics at later stages of our career, um, 
you know, not to fly. I mean, that's not even really seriously considered. Um, and I think, I mean, the push, actually, there is a push, really. I mean, I think a lot of what's going on in the last few years with the sustainability leads, a sustainability strategy within the university probably is a reaction to a demand from students. Um, so my answer would be, I mean, actually doing well, but keep on pushing hard. Um, yeah. Thanks, Julian. And Marianne, sorry to just direct this question at you, um, but do you think student societies could come into this? And with because I know like a lot of societies, they're there to, for new students to meet people and um, current students. So do you think societies are also an accessible way for people to get involved? Yeah, I think um, sort of in broadening the conversation and showing students how accessible sustainability can be, I think societies that don't focus on environmental topics or sustainability have a responsibility. I think there's definitely in sort of whatever industry like the society is sort of based in, um, I think there's definitely some kind of alternative that you can seek out and introduce to your members. I think um, it's just about making people aware and when you're on a committee you've got the power to make people aware of whatever you want and I think it's important that you're able to use that and relate it to things that matter, um, are topical and can make a difference. Thanks Marianne. Um, so I know Julie, oh sorry, go on Jo. I had one, I had one thing to add basically. Um, it's, in terms of what I'm doing, it's, uh, it's entrepreneurial. So in terms of an incentive for, for, for students and, and to sort of have a mutual benefit, um, it's to, it's, and this could not, not apply to what I'm doing, but it could be applied to all sort of areas and it could be distributed through the societies, is to offer internships. That could be the volunteer to get volunteers. Um, and then in return, they get some work experience, which will be good for when they leave university. So I've, I've had a couple of people ask me um, and in return, they learn how to code. I'll, I'll give them some advice on, on how to code certain things. So they get, they get that for when they leave and they can say they've worked for a bit of a comp a part of a company for, for a while, while they're at uni, when they go and get their new job out of uni. So that could be, that could be one way to include students is if there's more, if there's more um, opportunities given and it's sort of distributed through these, through these channels, it, it might be able to sort of keep, uh, Strengthen the bridge, so to speak. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Nana? Right, I'm, I'm just looking at uh, when it comes to students and uh, their lifestyle, looking at how they're going to be hum harmful to the, uh, let's say, the habitat or the natural environment. One thing that students could be thinking of is um, the invisible environmental cost when it comes to their uh, consumerism or, when, or looking at it from the ethical point of view. Um, because what I know is, uh, especially if you go to the shops and you want to buy stuff, and I know that most students would like to buy things daily, and we know that the clothing industry or the fashion industry, when it comes to like the impact on water, I think is second to the oil industry. So I think some of these messages, when it is much more clearer to students, and they know that when it comes to their purchasing habit, they should be thinking through an area of sustainability and the, and the invisible stuff that comes in when it comes to the ecosystem services. And I think uh, one way that they could be doing that is looking at the labels when it comes to food packages or even when it comes to some of these um, big retail companies. And then uh, we have more organizations doing well on that front when it comes to H&M, when it comes to Body Shop, Avon, and even Ikea. So um, students, their purchasing power, their lifestyle, looking at what some of these businesses or like the organizations that they deal with it most. One thing that they could be looking at is what is their vision and how is it, their sustainability vision and mission, how does it look like? So that could be an area that they could be looking into as well. Yeah, definitely. And do you, does anyone have any suggestions? Like, um, I know Julie, you mentioned the book earlier, but podcasts, but just general resources you feel like people um, could use to get either a foot into sustainability or to spark interest? There is, um, if anyone's interested, the, the University of Sussex, I think, has done a set of good MOOCs, the mass online open courses, which are free to sign up to. And they kind of take you through the science in a way for people like me, for non-scientists. And I think, again, that, that knowledge base is really important. So I would, I would recommend those. 
Thanks, Julie. Has anyone got any other suggestions? Um, there's quite a few sort of fashion resources that um, for the society's social media we sort of regularly promote. Um, I think the Slow Factory Fashion Revolution and the Fair Fashion Project are three very good places to start um, um, as a starting point to look into sustainable practices, what sort of fast fashion, fast fashion companies are actually up to. Um, and I think they also present their information um, in sort of quite a manageable way so it's not overwhelming to consume because I think that's quite a big issue that it is overwhelming and I know we've said that but it, it is very overwhelming and I think if you're short on time like a lot of students are um, it's that overwhelming feeling is just exacerbated. Thanks Marianne. Um, yeah so with our social media we have been doing challenges throughout the week and last week as well so we just wondered if each of our panelists would like to um, suggest a challenge our audience and hopefully the people who watch this with the recording um, could engage in if there's yeah anything big or small that you think you would challenge them to do. Uh, Julian should we start? Yes, sure. Um, I think one challenge that you set up already is, is, is excellent, um, which was not buying something for new for two weeks, right? Um, because I think something that came up now repeatedly in our discussion is sort of this individual responsibility to try as much as possible to escape this cheap, cheaper, the cheapest kind of um rational that we have and of course students understandably on really tight budget are very prone to that to go for that but then again i mean it's a weird anecdote in a way but i always buy the same jeans uh, because that makes life incredibly easy for me it's always a five or one from levis um, and i'm buying them since since ever um, and when i bought them about 20 oh god it might be even 30 years ago um, you know, they would basically last for five, six years and they just don't anymore. So there's like a, and that has also something to do with, they used to be more expensive actually. So in, in, in comparison, um, they were much more expensive when I bought them about 20, 30 years ago. Um, and I mean, this is, this is the paradox, right, about all these environmental questions, because we have made, in a way, in the last 50 years, so much progress um, in many aspects, cleaning the environment, cleaning the rivers, um, cutting down on, 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 on carbon emissions, at least in some parts. Uh, but then again, we sort of even embraced this throwaway attitude even further. Um, and I guess that would link also with, 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 with my challenge, which might be a little bit yucky, but I found it very, uh, it taught me something because I think we, we were obviously producing too much waste, plastic waste. And I mean, I found it striking how much, how many wrappers are involved when you buy something in the supermarket. And so initially just to make life a little bit easier for our bin men, because, uh, I thought it's quite nasty, right? When you have these sort of con contaminated, let's put it this way, plastic containers with, I don't know, mayonnaise all over it, or I don't know, chicken sauce or whatever it is that was in there. And you, you, you basically wash them. And so we started washing every plastic container, uh, which is not reusable. Well, they are, well we, obviously those two. But uh, so that was really insightful because I was just astonished how much you do it and you want to get rid of it. <laughs> so you automatically almost reduce the amount of plastic containers or you look out while shopping uh, how much wrapping is involved. Um, yeah, I don't know if anybody really wants to take that on, but uh, I found that helpful. Thanks, Julian. Julie? Can I suggest, um, so I became a vegetarian about 35 years ago and it was very unfashionable and if I mentioned it to anybody which I didn't but if they found out at the time they'd say oh well 
uh, how do you get protein or let me have a look at your shoes my shoes were never leather or animal based but they were plastic which was a different problem um, but I was always attacked for my lifestyle choices now if it ever comes up people say oh well I tend to eat meat only once or twice a week so I think um, it's really interesting to see that cultural shift and I think the more we can encourage um, I'm, I've set up an environmental group at my children's school and uh, we're encouraging kind of meat free Mondays where there is nothing on offer on a Monday that would have uh, that it was all it's all plant based on a Monday so that's a tiny a tiny uh, example but actually it has quite a big knock on effect and it also acculturates children and adults to understand that they can exist without meat and what those alternatives are and they don't have to come from a horribly overpackaged, processed alternative from the supermarket. So uh, I would go for a, a meat-free, a, a small meat-free trial. Thanks, Julie. Um, do we have any other challenges that you'd like to suggest? Right. Um, I'm impressed with the work that um, is it Joe and Ellie what they are doing. Um, what I'm trying to, what I'll be much more interesting to look at is um, how are we gonna be tackle the problems like um, biodiversity in devaluing the supply chain and looking at it from the fashion industry with key elements trying to account for some of these unsustainable practices such as um, greenhouse gas emissions, we're looking at water use, we're looking at air pollution and waste. So I think um, it's a question out there that uh, a challenge out there that um, I think some of these students who want to be, like work within the area of sustainability entrepreneurship, they can pick it up. It's quite good, interesting to see what they can come up with. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nana. And um, are there any other comments? No? Um, Julian, shall we pass it back to you and Adam and see if any of our audience have any questions? Sure. Um, I've seen that the chat window actually looks rather quiet if Adam doesn't have some secret access to another <laughs> uh, channel uh, where there have been plenty of questions. I mean, we do, don't have an awful lot of time remaining. Um, and I think there's no pain in, you know, closing earlier. I mean, that's fine. It's a, it's a hot, wonderful, well, depends on your position, but actually now it's cooling off a little bit. So it's actually quite nice. But nevertheless, I mean, all, everybody also presented their individual projects in a way. And I could, I, maybe somebody has questions which actually engage with, I don't know, Joe's Aunt Eater project or Ellie Snap Recycle or what Marion does for Fashion Society and wants to like ask like specific questions in relation to those projects. Um, and so, yes, feel encouraged to, to unmute um, and, and join the discussion if you like. Cool, so we have a question from Verity in the chat. Um, she's been making personal changes like going vegan, etc. but making these changes has just further revealed how unconducive our current systems are to these behaviours, which is demoralising. Just wondering if anyone has any ideas on how to get involved with pushing for system change. I'm seeing some snipe nodding from some panellists. If anyone's nodding, feel free to jump in. Well, I'll say something if nobody else will. I didn't want to hog. Um, I think that's brilliant, Verity. I think it's amazing. And I think um, one thing that I've learned is that you never know what ripple effect your small, apparently small changes may have. So don't be disheartened by feeling like you're the only vegan in town because it's unlikely that you are. Um, but also join those groups. I find that when I'm constantly battling against people who totally disagree with me it can be very demoralizing so i do need some time with people like the people in front of me right now and you um who share my values already and i don't feel as though i have to persuade the entire world that's not your role um, but i think join these groups also join we, we need a change to our political classes and our political way of thinking when we look at rishi sunak's proposals to get us out of where we are right now 
there should be a massive investment in taking very seriously the green the greening of our economic activities there's some greenwashing going on there hs2 continues apace and uh, pushing forward non-sustainable housing stock on green land um, and uh, widening our motorways and encouraging greater car use there's a lot of uh, real problems um, but we need to be actively opposing that in the political realm as well as in our personal and social ones. So stick with the people you know, have your echo chamber for self-protection, <laughs> but keep pushing hard on those other areas too, because you, 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 you will be making a difference even if you don't always know it. Cool, does anyone wanna, Eric, wanna jump in on that? Or uh, we can move on. Is anyone with any other things to say on system change? Well, maybe just very briefly, because I would endorse completely uh, what, 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 what Julie has said, but um, it is demoralizing. But in a weird way, and we are in this echo chamber, but it's also very, in a weird way, it's satisfying. Uh, because, I mean, this it, climate change is a reality, um, and we will have to change our behaviors. And eventually everybody will have to change their behaviors and we have to live in a different way. Um, and there may, may also be a chance to actually really rethink this system, neoliberal system, whatever. And um, I think this is in the making and sort of getting, embracing and enjoying this, this life and actually taking really some, some, some really joy out of it and fun. Um, will be great further down the line because it'll come. Um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I think I can add to that. Um, yeah, I think what um, this particular question is much more relevant. Um, I traveled to Ghana, that was um, this year for, for a research and I was much more like, you know, delving in much deeper into this kind of area of air pollution, climate change. And I think what you can be finding out when it comes to the area of sustainability, it shouldn't always be about climate change. So it's much more or less about trying to understand how the systems work and how it impacts or interrelates with each other. So um, you try to talk about climate change, they don't, they, like they don't understand it. Nobody bothers because if you know that people are thinking about no poverty, they are thinking about hungry, to have sustainable cities and communities, and then you're going to be looking at issues with air pollution, which is a major issue. So what could happen is, and we know that um, when it comes to measures being used to address air pollution, they are the same thing that is also being used to address climate change anyway. So it's much more about how we understand how the system works and how it interrelates with each other. But then um, I know that the climate science could be some sort of very convoluted sometimes, and it could be much more difficult for like, let's say a lay person to understand that. But when you're thinking about sustainability, I don't think we sh you shouldn't reject sustainability, but what you can do more is about trying to understand, especially, and I think you can be looking at it from the lens of, um, through the SDGs. And I think there are many things out there which um, like one can pick it up when it comes to sustainability. Cool, thank you. Um, nice, okay, so let's move on to uh, another question from Fee. Um, sometimes it feels like discussions on sustainability are like preaching to the converted, even though we can all keep making more changes to our lifestyles. But what can we do to really push further and involve those who might reject sustainability or not believe in climate change? And maybe we could have some other panelists who um, haven't spoken for a while. That'd be nice to hear with and your opinion. Um, I have something that I could say. Uh, I think people who, who firstly don't believe in climate change, I think they're probably the hardest to convert. Um, the ones who reject sustainability, perhaps there could be definitely more, more done. Um, I think I think it's to, I think there's two ways to really get around it. It's to, to provide incentive. If there are ways of providing incentive to, to, to these people who, so where they get some added benefit other than the feeling of, of doing something good for the planet. Um, for example, in Germany, they get money back for putting bottles in, in, um, in shops and they pay a bit extra for the bottle. That, those sort of things are incentives. Um, I think if we can move towards that to sort of persuade these people, 
um, I think that's something we could do and um, maybe more enforcement in laws as well with like the things like bins and so forth as well or so for example contaminated as it was previously mentioned co contaminated plastics and so forth is a huge problem for um, for um, recycling uh, in the recycling industry so it's some some sort of laws the councils enforcing a bit more on that side of things things like that I think could all help that's everything from me <laughs> Thanks. Would, would anyone else like to jump in? Yeah, maybe. I think crucially, I mean, money makes the world go round. Um, so I think it needs to, it's needs, it needs to pay off to make these changes to, 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 to get the, get those out there that might be not deniers of climate change, but might not be fully embracing uh, more sustainable practices. Um, but I think in that regard, this panel is encouraging as well. I think we are seeing increasingly, fortunately, not enough, but increasingly business ideas which thrive and work on sustainability. And I mean, Joe and Ali, uh, you will try to make money with this as well. And, you know, um, finance a good, a good life. And I think if we, if we move towards an economy which is sustainable and actually, I mean, it's very much what Joe said about incentives, which awards more sustainable practices. Uh, we, 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 we get the unconverted. Okay, then I think, okay, I think I can add to that. Um, one thing that we could be looking to is more about of which lacks is when it comes to data and knowledge transfer and capacity building. Um, I remember working with the local authority and then we have to make a case for um, what do we call it um, when it comes to air pollution, citing this kind of air, air pollution and uh, monitoring areas. So then you have to, like if you look at a look, working with the local counselors, then it's more about what is the data that you have to convince them to go to school so that the schools will be having travel plan, you know. So uh, then you have to present to them, you have to make sure that, and, Interestingly, could you believe that that particular local authority, all the schools that came up, up, they were much more under the air quality monitoring areas, which like data hasn't come up with. And I think from there, you could see these councillors and local authorities leaders started making, taking some sort of robust measures in addressing some of these air pollution within schools. So uh, coming back to some of these issues with sustainability, climate change, and all those kind of um, uh, topics, I think, uh, the lack of knowledge and data, I think, is one of the key things. And I think as academics, and those, those are some of the areas that uh, we, we need to also work on it more. And then we're going to be having issues when it comes to financing some of these things. Um, it's just like, you know, I made, I made a case about air pollution as well. Working on telling people that, oh, okay, the volumes are very high, but what is the data to show them? So once you show them, they could know that, oh, okay, this is what is happening and they could be working on it. So uh, without data and without knowledge and capacity building, I think uh, it's gonna be very difficult to be working on those kind of paradigms as well. Thanks. Does anyone else um, wanna share their thoughts? Cool, okay. One question I had, um, sometimes it's hard with, in the world, there are lots of issues, lots of things going wrong, and sometimes it feels sort of like you're forced to choose between which issues you want to prioritize in your activism. So my question is, um, how can we kind of sort of join up our thinking so it feels like we aren't kind of, you know, running, putting out fires all over the place and trying to, and what, is there something that we could do to create a sort of more I don't know, integrated maybe policy atmosphere or policy kind of, or like activism atmosphere. I've done a lot of work on transnational activism. Um, my focus is on Southeast Asia and uh, particularly on looking at, at groups that are opposing dam building and or land reclamation. And um, what you tend to find there is that campaigns come together a little bit like Extinction Rebellion actually of people who in their daily lives work on far more specific causes so it may be uh, women's groups or um, farmers groups or um, a local geographical group and actually knowing when to share your forces and work together to get greater political leverage 
is one thing and finding the common language by which I don't mean necessarily English although or a language of a state although that is the case in Southeast Asia that that's a problem but the common language of how to address and work with the European Union or the United Nations structures and the bureaucratic language to get grants or to get access um, so pooling resources and doing some joint capacity building I think is really important for our local levels here as well so knowing when to to join forces but actually then knowing when not to and when your own uh, seemingly small area needs its own um, needs its own space and its own spotlight so I think it's okay not to know sometimes and to have your foot in various camps and sometimes both of your feet are working for the same goal, but it might be a campaign rather than a longer term plan of action. So great. I think it's great. <laughs> and I think uh, I can add to that. Um, what could happen is when it comes to environmental activism, who calls the shot? Um, so let's say uh, you, you want to be involved in some of these uh, activism when it comes to sustainability but then you don't understand the science or you don't have the knowledge but then maybe you might be thinking about following for people are like just doing i think that's where the problem is and then um, when it comes to activism um that's why i say like depending it, it might it should be much more or less at the local level because let's say you know most of the time some of these things uh, it start from the top and it, it comes down and when you tell people to accept it or to follow the like for instance yes let's use um, climate change as an example if you talk about climate change in some of these low medium income countries like it's not going to be ringing a bell too much you know and when it comes to responsible let's say consumption and then uh, when it comes to uh, production patterns it could be bringing a bell when you, you, you use that one as the as a backdrop to be addressing issues with climate change so knowing how to knowing the look the local context the issues in there and just trying to come up with activism i think it could work and then i think there are some sort of 10 principles of fair trade which i think uh, people can be looking into that one as well when it comes to if they want to move into activism because they've got all the elements in there when it comes to respect for the environment promote fair trade no child labor or forced labor when it comes to discrimination gender equity freedom of association good working conditions capacity building fair payments fair trade practices transparency and accountability so i think uh, if you look at that kind of 10 principles of fair trade everything is in there if you want to move into the um, the area of environmental activism and i think based on that at the local context that's where it's going to know that oh okay this is not good for the environment this is not good for and i think you have to think of sustainability as well because uh, that's where you have the social context the environmental context and the economic aspect that comes in as well so depending on the direction that you're going to become i think uh, you could be using these uh, 10 principles as a backdrop to much more or less uh, expand on your horizon looking at it from the environmental activism point of view oh thanks um does anyone else want to go in um have anything to say or we can go to Kirsty's question uh no it looks like you're up Kirsty. thanks sorry i just didn't want to like type it badly so that it offended anyone um because i think this is such like an important um, issue but um, as I've been doing like studying on sustainability obviously there's always going to be an issue of like striking a balance between creating sustainability and also other needs of either individuals like the economy and um, everything like that and um, so like an example that I'm going to be looking into for my dissertation next year is um, like veganism and veg being vegetarian is so good for it is good for the environment they've proven it but you know some like i also do sports science and is it always going to be sustainable for someone's health and so it's always like a balance between two things and also like judy i think it's amazing that you don't fly um but i know personally i would not be able to do that with my plans for the future and everything like that so like how do you think going forward we're going to make different industries and areas of expertise achieve sustainability in a sustainable way for everyone <laughs> Well, okay. Um, and I think that is where responsible business comes in. Um, looking at what our center is trying to do and what it's trying to achieve. 
like when it comes to business, is what could be, what could it mean when it comes to responsible business? Trying to balance the uh, the three dimensions of meeting your economic goals and profit, balancing the social aspect, and just trying to look at the ecological or um, when it comes to um, the environmental aspect within your the particular th settings that you are, you are operating. So um, I think even within the, like if you look at traditionally, you could see that um, we've been using the concept of corporate social responsibility. That's what they mean and all those kind of stuff. But uh, if you look at that aspect, I think um, you could see that it's been waking up a little bit because uh, you try to use the, like let's say the sustainable development goals, like the 17 criteria in which businesses could be meeting. And you could see that businesses have got a lot to do. So um, in respect to the question about greenhouse gas emission, you know, and I think that's why I say it's more about the data, you know, because um, let's say if, let's say somebody's sending into a vegan, then there could be some sort of reason that he's, he or she is doing that. So, um, and we know that methane emission is part, it, like, it is highest on the list when it comes to greenhouse gas emission. So I think some of these data and understanding bring it out into the local context or to the layman understanding, I think it's quite, um, it's quite important as well. So um, the role of academics and then businesses, I think they've got a role to play in there. Well, I mean, that went rather well. Uh, I mean, that was uh, quite a lively discussion uh, in the last uh, 20 minutes and we're spot on time, two minutes till our intended closure time. Um, I think we're moving forward um, step by step really slowly and I think Adam posed also a really important question with the juggling of sort of increasingly understanding that everything ties and links in together and on the other hand sort of then this feeling that being overwhelmed by that fact and sort of being almost not satisfied enough or with with the little section you're working on don't be uh every little contribution and whatever detailed section of this whole thing matters um and and, and pushes is for the good um and yes many thanks uh, for everybody joining uh today and of course a big massive thank you uh to all our panelists and uh, yes, the recording will be available. Thank you. Cool. Yes, basically, <laughs> I will, <laughs> we will close down now. See you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming.